All right. Good morning, everyone. It is Health Talk. I'm Peter Christian, John King over there. And uh, joining us this morning from Providence St. Patrick Health and Services is Tim Descamps, Executive Director of the International Heart Institute of Montana Foundation. That's really a mouthful. Tim, how are you? I'm doing fine this morning. It's good to to see you guys. usually talk to you on the phone. Yes. About this time of year for for the big symposium that's coming up. Correct. So before we get to that, though, let's let's talk about, first of all, what is the International Heart Institute? uh, And and what what does the foundation have to do with it? And then we'll get into the symposium. Well, the Heart Institute, as you know, is a clinical practice um, of, um, you know, uh, cardiac specialists who have combined together to deliver integrated care uh, to patients across Montana and actually uh, throughout the Intermountain West. Now, now how, how in the world did St. Patrick and Providence, was this initiated by Providence St. Patrick Hospital, or did they choose to actually settle in with your organization? So the Heart Institute Foundation actually was started before the Heart Institute itself. Oh, okay. And it's, uh, the, the foundation is a partnership between the University of Montana and between St. Patrick Hospital. Um, and they, could, they started the foundation first. In fact, the intent was to actually have the clinical practice part of the foundation. Uh, as it turned out, the foundation has become the research and clinical arm, or the research and educational arm, for the clinical practice, which is the Heart Institute. So but when most people think of a foundation, they think of kind of a fundraising organization, but it's obviously much greater than that. It's much greater, and we, we specifically have been formed to improve patient care through research and education, as opposed to more trying to raise money or do things that maybe a traditional found what you might think a traditional foundation would do. Now, the International Heart Foundation, I know you, you chose the term international for a reason. No, why is that? Well, we were started by a physician who um, came who was, was from Spain. He actually um, got the medical license number one uh, here in the state of Montana. Wow. That was a special act of the legislature to allow Dr. Carlos Duran to come and um, practice medicine here. He was an expert in his field of mitral valve surgery, and he um, really enjoyed Missoula. He came here and was attending the Rocky Mountain Valve Symposium for many years before he actually then um, came in and started practicing uh, at the Heart Institute. Now, Dr. Duran, for the folks who've been around Missoula for a long time, that is quite, quite literally a legendary name right now, right? He is, he is one of the pioneers in cardiac surgery. Mm-hmm. There's a handful of people uh, that started the sort of the, the practice of cardiovascular surgery, and he's one of them. All right. So we were fortunate to have him come to Missoula. How did, this, how did the Valve Symposium get its start? The Valve Symposium got its start, and it's, it's our 25th year. Right. We got started in 1990. So I, I love your headline, Rocky, Rocky 25. Rocky 25, <laughs> yes. That was 25 years, and right. in that 25 years, certainly the practice mm. of cardiovascular medicine and the practice of cardiovascular surgery have changed. But the desire to always stay at the cutting edge of what is the best treatment for patients has never changed. And that's what started the, the Rocky Mountain Valve Symposium. There's so much that we don't know, and even then you think that you have learned something, there's still more to learn, and that's what the Rocky is able to teach us, and it actually allows us to really stay current with what is the best practice in the field of cardiovascular medicine. Now, when, when you folks uh, talk about a valve symposium, uh, obviously there, there are, the heart is, is a, a very complex organ. And so there's, there's lots more than valves, right? I mean, there's other things that you study. And our focus is on the heart valves. So mm-hmm. it's the aortic valve, mm-hmm. it's the mitral valve, it's the tricuspid valve. And th- these are areas of the heart that we know uh, are still learning about and, and, um, and still a lot of information that needs to be gained that can be gained only by sharing amongst um, the experts in the field. And we have found that Missoula is a unique place to, for that to happen. Yeah, it's interesting that, that Missoula, Montana, of all the places in the world, really, that could hold uh, something like this, it's very prestigious for Missoula, is it not? It's extremely prestigious, and it puts us on the map, um, and you can go to almost any medical center in the country and talk about the Rocky Mountain Valve Symposium, and they'll know 
uh, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And they'll have heard about it, they'll have had a colleague attend, or they'll know one of our surgeons or one of our cardiologists. Now, now so, even, even though there are, there are uh, renowned uh, heart surgeons all over the country, all over the world, why do they choose to come to Missoula for this symposium? They came uh, at first because of Dr. Duran. They, came, they kept coming back because Missoula is a unique place for people to gather. It's a very relaxed and it's a very hospitable environment for actually sharing information and getting to know each other a lot better than you would if you went to a big city for a conference. Um, people actually end up coming back. They've, uh, they've bought homes here because they've enjoyed it so much. They've learned that... So the Chamber of Commerce loves you guys. <laughs> <laughs> they love us. Yeah. All right. Um, and now we have a group that, are, that enjoy our, our streams and our rivers and are coming to fish after the conference. All right. Now, so, what, are they, what are they specifically going to learn during the week of the, the valve symposium? So this symposium this time is focused on the mitral valve. And it's uh, surgical and interventional because now there are interventional options for the treatment of mitral valve disease. Um, it's similar to what was happening with aortic valve disease where we've now seen that there's treatment options for percutaneous or for stent uh, devices to be uh, implanting valves, which is an alternative to open heart surgery. And the same thing is now beginning to happen with mitral valve. So we're looking at both surgical and interventional uh, treatments to the mitral valve disease. I wanted to ask you a little bit, uh, John brought up an interesting point in that uh, evidently you folks have been discussing the fact that uh, the International Heart Institute has been uh, trusted by the FDA to do, to do some trials and, and treatments, things like that, right? Clinical trials, okay. um, and especially in the area of device trials. Um, we've become actually nationally recognized for the number of trials and the enrollments that we have in those trials. How does that, how does that work? I mean, is, is that something that they, they come to you, do you come to them, or is it mutual? Well, companies are going through a process of trying to get their devices or their drugs approved for commercial use, and they have to do these uh, trials. They're, uh, at this point, they're phase three trials, and they're going uh, to international, and they're um, across the country, and they have to look at a certain population size, and so they come to Missoula to be one of those sites for enrollment into trials. How's that gone so far? Have there, have, have there been anything that uh, that you folks have worked on that are now in general use? Well, we've worked on a number of uh, stent trials with uh, Abbott Vascular, and it's been um, starting in um, around 2005. And so we've had a 10-year history with that company in looking at a various types of, of stents that they've taken out to commercialization. And the latest one is an absorbable stent that will actually be absorbed. Wow. Uh, and that's the latest product that we have. Fantastic. Um, and so it's been a series of trials. We're uniquely qualified only because of the way the practice is organized. Very unusual to have um, where the clinicians and the procedure rooms and um, are all in the same location and that the doctors are all um, organized under one clinical practice. And so the focus is always on what's best for the patient. And you can have a lot of hallway conversations and a lot of meetings that take place. Well, what it does is it allows for these types of trials to, to, to be conducted. Is, is there a way that you can help the, the, the public understand sometimes why it takes so long to uh, to approve something that's new when it comes to the FDA, especially something as sensitive that goes on in the heart. So ultimately, it's about patient safety and about making sure that something that gets approved is going to be safe for, for the public. And so there's always this tension between having a therapy that might improve something today versus the danger that that therapy might have some hidden risk. And so it's always a balance. And the balance is maybe aired toward on the safety side, but it's always been really conducted in a very thorough way to make sure that when that device is approved, that it is, uh, it, it is completely safe. How does the IHI fit into that? I, I, are, are you doing enough trials to the point where the FDA says, okay, you guys have proven it to us, we're going to put it on the market now? So the, the approval process actually occurs with the company it does. Okay. that has to get through and submit to the FDA. Right. We're but a data point 
within that uh, process. So they collect data from our site and all other sites to ensure that there's enough s data statistically to you know demonstrate that it's safe. Now this th th this isn't just through the Rocky Mountain uh, Symposium. This is through the IHI in general, right? The clinical trials, so uh, the foundation is the group that helps organize the trials. We staff, uh, our staff coordinates the trials. It's the physicians at the practice that are the physician investigators uh, for the trials. Okay. Um, now, when, when people, uh, obviously, they come from all over the world to the symposium, what, do, what exactly, I, I see you have kind of a, a layout here, course objectives right. of what they'll learn. And to the layman, it might, it might seem like Greek, but maybe you can explain to us what, what exactly they'll be learning. Well, so it's adult learning, which is a different process than, say, if you're... And so there's a lot of hands-on learning that right. takes place because to actually put, a, um, to put people into a room and just, you know, uh, lecture at them can be kind of um, exhausting. So we couple a lot of the lectures that we have, and what we do is we bring experts from around the country and the world to lecture on topics that are, um, you know, particular to the to the subject at hand, but then we couple that with hands-on learning. So some of the same experts are able to say, this is actually how you do this surgical procedure. So we have somebody who, uh, Dr. Lowry, who is perfected something called the American Correction for Mitral Valve uh, Repair, and it's a particular procedure. He is the country's expert. He'll lecture on that topic, and then at the uh, end of the day, he will actually demonstrate how that surgical procedure is done. We bring, we set out uh, pig hearts uh, to actually uh, demonstrate how um, the procedure is done. These pig hearts are actually specific um, for this type of, of classroom instruction. And um, why pig hearts, you might ask? And because they mirror the human heart as closely as possible. And so it's always been uh, instructive to kind of use those types of hearts as opposed to other um, animal hearts. I remember a couple of years ago, I was privileged to come and actually video uh, a little bit of the, uh, basically under, mm -hmm. under a big microscope right. of how, how this is all done. And, and for those of us who don't understand surgery at all, except for the fact that we, you know, we, we go in, they put us under, right. we come out, and we've got stitches. <laughs> yes. All right. So how, how does that work with, with the people who are there with you? Do they, do they mirror what you're doing while you're doing it, or do you stand over their shoulder, or what? How does that work? So there'll be uh, the instructor, the um, surgical expert will be in front, of the, uh, in front of the class. He'll have an overhead camera on the heart so you can look up on a screen and actually see how he is uh, suturing or implanting the device at hand that, that he's using. Um, there'll be proctors that we have in the classroom that will walk around and answer any questions that the um, the attendees have and help them if they get uh, if they get stumbled on a particular aspect of the procedure, uh, and then it's a very you know painstaking methodical way of looking at how to do this, and then uh, the instructor will oftentimes go around and help do one on one instruction. Um, each each attendee has their own set of instruments. They share a pig heart. Um, it's it's actually a, a very, you know, there's nothing like it when it comes to instruction. So is it like practice makes perfect? I mean, over you're allowed to do it as many times as you want or what? Practice makes perfect. <laughs> so for many years, the, the Rocky Mountain Valve Symposium was known for live surgery. And so we would be able to, with obviously all the right consents, be able to show a procedure in place. Uh, and so they could learn the same way as a heart surgeon, a master surgeon was mm -hmm. practicing a technique. We stopped doing that um, around 2007, 2008. Um, and so now, really, this kind of hands-on is, is really the, is what we are really known for. I can imagine how difficult it must be to try to arrange. I mean, how do you arrange to have someone with a certain type of problem to be available for surgery at the time when all these people are coming together? We had many patients who really were very, who, who took a lot of pride to be the to be the subject for wow. uh, for this type of um, of, of of instruction, and um, and typically it would be a mitral valve surgery that um, and they would actually volunteer and wait um, until the day of the event. They felt like they would have not just one surgeon, but you know, fifty surgeons, you know, helping them through the procedure. So <laughs> at no extra at charge. no extra charge. <laughs> right. okay. Exactly. Now uh, I want to ask you. 
Uh, the Valve Symposium is coming up when, exactly? It's uh, coming up on July 23rd, and it goes for two and a half days. So it's uh, Thursday, Friday, and a half day Saturday. Um, the surgeons and the cardiologists that attend show up at 7.30 in the morning, and uh, they're there till 5.30 at night. So they get to play beforehand and afterwards, but not during. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, what, what part of, of any of this is open to the public that, that they can find out more and learn more about this? So we have a website. It's the Rocky Mountain uh, Valve Symposium dot org. You can take a look at our agenda that we have for the meeting. The meeting is uh, is for physicians to earn continuing medical education. So it's not open to the public. Right. We offer in February a heart expo, which actually takes some of the same topics, and really we open it up to the public. We get a thousand people who show up. I was there. Yes, and uh, and our physicians volunteer their time and um, will actually, um, you know, provide uh, lectures uh, on different type of subjects, uh, and that's really our public event that mm-hmm. we have. All right. So what are you specifically looking forward to in, in, in Rocky 25? Is there anything that is, is, I just can't wait for this to come because? Well, because we have, I think in this um, uh, uh, meeting, we have several really well-known, highly respected surgeons who are coming uh, because it's the 25th uh, anniversary of the Rocky. We have um, a gentleman who is uh, Gerald Lowry, who I mentioned before. Um, there is... Um, a gentleman who is coming from uh, Pennsylvania. His name is uh, Dr. Gorman. He's very well known within the field of cardiovascular research. Um, there's um, another person who is very expert in the in the atrial fibrillation, uh, Dr. Cox, and he's been here before and he's coming back. So we have some very, I think, you know, really well-known surgeons attending. Is there only a, a space for a certain number of surgeons to come, and is it competitive to be able to come? It's competitive to come, and we also have cardiologists, so I don't want to underplay yeah. the fact that <laughs> okay. there isn't room for cardiologists. Right, 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 right. Um, but we have a limited number of um, uh, lectures, and so we, uh, we don't want to have somebody just come in and lecture, do one lecture and then leave. Right. And so um, we try to get to a balance of optimum number of faculty and, and lectures. All right. Now, how, how, do you, how do you gauge the success of a symposium? The, the, the best indicator is the reviews and the evaluations that we get at the end of the meeting. I have other, you know, we like to see the attendance. Um, we like to see good attendance. But more importantly, we want to see that the, the meeting met its objectives. And the best indicator of that is the, evalu- is the course evaluations that occur after the end of the meeting. And the fact that the, the, the procedures that you're teaching are being used effectively uh, as they spread out and head home. Right. So the course evaluation asks, you know, was, this, was the content useful to you and will you be able to use that in your practice when you go back to your home institution. So how far ahead do you plan these? I mean, I'm sure you probably got the next one already lined out as to what you want to talk about. Well, this is a 12-month process. Right, yeah. So we typically use August to wrap up the event. We have a lot of paperwork that has to be submitted for the educational credits. And then in September, we start planning for the next year's event. And then it just takes that long to go through. Um, if folks want to find out more about the International Heart Institute and the foundation, and of course the symposium, where can they go to get information? We have a website, the International Heart Institute Montana Foundation dot org. Uh, it's a it's a long it's all one word, and you can Google it, and you can Google it, <laughs> and we're there. Hey so. Tim, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Great information. Thank you. All right, thank and uh, that's going to do it for Health Talk. We thank you for joining us. We'll do it again next week.